Welcome to the Financial Advisor Success Podcast, where you go behind the scenes with financial planner, speaker, and consultant Michael Kitsis to hear stories of how leading financial advisors navigated the inevitable challenges that arise on the path to success and get insight from leading industry consultants about how to break through to the next level in your advisory business. And now here's your host, Michael Kitsis. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the 364th episode of the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. My guest on today's podcast is Ted Jenkin. Ted is the consultant of JPTV Partners based in Atlanta, Georgia, which helps financial advisors gather offers, negotiate, and ultimately sell their advisory firms. What's unique about Ted, though, is how his journey to facilitate advisor mergers and acquisitions started from selling his own 2.2 billion AUM advisory firm that he spent more than a decade building. And the perspective he gained as a founder who sold his firm influenced the way that he now helps other advisors prepare for and understand all the acquisition offers that may be placed in front of them and their own options to exit their firms that they may have spent their careers building. In this episode, we talk in depth about how after Ted went through the challenge of getting multiple offers to sell his own firm and struggling to figure out how to compare them, he found that many other advisors were asking him for advice based on his experience and ultimately decided to build a consulting firm to help them. How Ted has now come to see himself as a Zillow for an advisory practice is worth as he got deeper into the weeds of evaluating how buyers are really assessing the value of an advisory firm and price its true profit margins. And how Ted's unique niche as an advisor who sold helping other advisors to sell has led to the point where after just a few years, his firm is now representing 115 active other advisory firms shopping for a buyer and allowing them to get even deeper into the current trends of what buyers are really offering and how to maximize the value of the deal. We also talk about how Ted initially built his own advisory firm with what he calls a manufactured celebrity approach by immersing himself in media appearances that made him a go-to local advisor in the Atlanta area. How the success of Ted's marketing approach ironically led to severe burnout because Ted enjoyed marketing for clients far more than the ongoing servicing of clients and the management of a large multi-billion dollar firm that resulted in him exiting early when he was still in his 40s. And how Ted overcame his nerves of becoming an employee again as a result of selling the firm and negotiated his own buyout deal to play into those same strengths relating to his ability to grow and ultimately resulted in a bigger payout in the end. And be starting to listen to the end where Ted shares what he would recommend advisors consider in their own exit plan to maximize value, even if the transition is still years down the road. How Ted has often found that determining the real value of a firm is so much more complex than just looking at its revenue or the bottom line of its profitability. And how Ted learned that while he had considerable strengths in some parts of the businesses, he wishes he had outsourced his weaknesses to others sooner, despite his fear of giving up control, and realized that if he had, he probably would have been able to stay with the business longer and continue to build it even bigger and make it more valuable. And so with that introduction, I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Financial Advisor Success Podcast with Ted Jenkin. Welcome, Ted Jenkin, to the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. Good to be with you, Michael. Looking forward to this. I'm really excited to have you join us. You are are now one of a uh, like a very small exclusive club of I don't know. I guess I'm gonna call it like the the two timers. You're joining us for a second time. You you were out in one of like the the first hundred episodes of this podcast back more more than five almost six years ago now uh, with what was a, at the time an incredible practice. You guys had grown like a billion dollars in 10 years, all organic with just this incredible marketing machine and systems that you'd built and scaled. And and I know in the years since, both the, the firm continued to grow further, which I'm excited to talk about, but even more so, uh, you, you sold it. And now I've gone down the road of working with consulting with other advisors about selling their businesses as well. And and I find it interesting because one of the cha- I mean like one of the fundamental challenges for any of us when we build these advisory firms to sell, like most of us will only ever do this once in our lifetimes. Like you you spend 30 plus years building your advisory firm over your career and then when you're ready to retire and exit, you sell. Some people even are in for 40 years or 50 years, maybe it's just 20 if you started a little bit later and as a career changer, but like we build the whole thing over our career. We sell it once. You basically only get one shot to do it right. And almost by definition, you don't know anything about how this works because <laughs> you've never done it before. And then by the time you do, you're 
you're done and you've retired and we're, and we're off into the sunset. And so the fact that you've come to this from a different path, both for what you built, you you functionally sold it much, much earlier in your career. You you are not by any means retired and, and still moving on to build more other businesses along the way. And so I, I like I'm both excited to just talk about where the firm went in the like five plus years since you were joining us in 2018 at a billion dollars, but also just the lessons learned and the experiences of having been through the sale and now continuing on the other side in, in working with other advisors through their sales and what, what you've learned now that you've seen all of this. So I think to start, because there's going to be a lot here we're going to be getting through, uh, to start, just catch us up on the advisory firm. Again, in 2018, you guys were crossing a billion dollars under management. What's happened with the advisory firm over the years since? Look, the, it's been a remarkable last five years for me, uh, transformative, if you will. If if I When we end this and you see what I'm doing today, had you told me I'd be doing that five years later, I would have said no way because uh, it definitely was not a, a design plan. But the firm now has about $2.2 billion that it's handling for clients. So it's literally almost doubled in value. And I don't know if it's like – that Rockefeller slogan where they say, you know, to turn $100 into $110 is hard work, but to turn $100 million into $110 million is inevitable. <laughs> but I think all advisors need to realize, like their clients' wealth, that when you get size and scale in your business, it's like getting to $100 million is tough. $200 million happens quicker. I think the same thing is once you get to a billion, it's hard. But to get to $2 billion is quicker because we, we are – and the firm still is organically this year going to bring in $250 million of new assets. It's a significant amount of new asset flow. Um, but Which I just put in the context, right? So you went from a billion to $2 billion plus in about five years. Yeah. But it took you 10 years to get to a billion in the first place, right? As you're Correct. saying, you're, you're going to do $250 million in new assets this year. And I'm going to guess it was what? five plus years to get to 250 million cumulatively, like yeah. from scratch originally. Yeah. Because look, you know, um, I think a lot of big firms realize this, like, you know, no, when you're a smaller boutique shop or you're a one person, two person shop, uh, no matter how good you are at your craft, the truth is that clients that have maybe 5 million, especially at 10 million plus the set of services that, that they need and the cachet of the firm that they're looking for. It's not that you're a bad advisor. They're just probably not going to give you the money, which is why for years, the big wirehouse has got all the money. But now we've got larger, bigger independent firms where, you know, clients that have that kind of wealth and more of them are having it are seeing the value in those kinds of companies. I will also tell you, and I'd say this, and you might laugh when I say it, to a degree, celebrity is manufactured. And a lot of advisors that do well, somebody in the firm has some level of manufactured celebrity, meaning that they may be on CNBC or, you know, I, I was doing TV every single weekend for CNN headline news and it didn't really make me a better advisor, Michael, but people that had larger money said, hey, I, I see you on national TV, you must be good. And I say, well, you can think what you want to think. If that's what you want to think, I don't think I'm bad, but if you think I'm good, then you know we'll take more of your money. And that scaled as your as your size of the firm grows and and the manufactured nature of your celebrity grows. I really feel that. All right. So so I actually wanna I wanna understand this a little bit more because because there is a piece of <laughs> Of what you're saying here that that strikes me and, and frankly, I feel like contrasts with the experience that I see at a lot of advisory firms where uh you know they power forward to what I have to find is kind of this like billion dollar threshold where you grow a firm, you get there for a lot of advisors, like they don't even do it in the 10 years that you did. I, I find 15, 20 plus years is is much more common. And by the time they get there, the growth rate doesn't turn up where 10 years for the first billion, five years for the second, it slows down for it's sort of a phenomenon I've always called like the tyranny of the denominator, which is right, right. Right, when your firm's a billion dollars, 
like 10% growth is a lot. Like it's a hundred million dollars. All of a sudden you're like, cool. I need two new millionaires every week, all year long, just to get 10% growth. And you're not really going to get that because your right. entire clients are taking out. So you might have 3% in retirement withdrawals, another point or two in, in tax money that goes out. Uh, there's a little bit of client attrition, even if you're doing really well. And all of a sudden it's like, wow, if I get uh, two new millionaires every week, all year long, I'll go from like a billion to 1.02 right, right. Uh, and And I may still grow over time because markets tend to lift us, but organic growth rates for a lot of firms really start to flatten because all of a sudden, like when you're at a billion dollars, 3% client attrition is 30 million out the door. 3% withdrawals is another 30 million out the door. And those numbers get really hard to overcome, especially if you're the advisor founder has been doing it for 20 years and you're like, wow, I've grown this big firm and like I have to work harder than I ever did before just to bring in enough money to tread water. So what's what's different that you guys had this seem to have this uptick as you got to the threshold where others seem to struggle. Like at least one piece I'm hearing that I have seen in others as well is is sort of this, I guess, frustrating reality when you're a smaller firm that there are a subset of larger clients that just have a preference for larger firms. And as your firm gets a little bigger and more established and just has more presence and gravitas and people on the website and sort of substance, visible substance that you tend to attract some bigger clients and that and that there is a bigger firms get bigger clients thing. And it sounds like that was part of it for you. But yeah, what you know, Michael, I mean, first of all, uh, we didn't have the challenge with withdrawals because when I built the firm in 2008, we were, I don't know if we were the first, but we had to be one of the first that really went after the X and Y generation. And, um, you know, a lot of people said, you're really stupid for doing that because they don't have any money. And I thought to myself, but they're gonna have some money. And I wouldn't be dealing with that RMD situation where I'd have a bunch of 75 year olds or whatever age now that we're taking money out of the plan. So the average age in the firm right now is 51. So you have to think about it. We still have a very, very young client. Two, oh, interesting. I mean, you have clients, ironically, from that end, 50. If your average client age is 51, like 51. They're, they're now in what most of us would characterize as peak earnings, peak right. savings years. No, that that's true. And we we tend to deal, uh, you know, obviously with a, a higher wealth Gen X, Gen Y, which a lot of them have a lot more money still than I think a lot of advisors think that they do. But two, I always felt when we started the firm, you know, ever since I started blogging back in 2008 and doing crazy stuff on social media that people said that didn't make any sense at that time. And maybe it did or maybe it didn't. But in the end, a lot of advisors discount, I think, their brand and how much, at least in a, in a regionalized basis, like if you live in Chicago or, you know, I'm in Atlanta, you know, people people uh, said, well, what local firms do you know in Atlanta? We would be one of the firms that they would know. Now, we spent a lot of money over time, Michael, on marketing. And when I say marketing, I don't mean just direct ROI. I mean indirect ROI, right? Having people care about the brand and how we put the brand into the community and on the radio and on TV. And that that allowed us to be able to have more people come to us to bring in those assets, irrespective of what was going on with COVID, the markets, you know, wh whatever it may be. And so, I think that, that that aided win to our sales. So so can you share a little bit more like what what is then the marketing you were doing like just where are you actually spending spending money yeah. spending time and effort to build this local presence that you're you're a go-to firm in the Atlanta area so for for many many years in here I was never a big fan of the advertorial Saturday guy or gal radio show you know we're the retirement income guys here you know I, I was never a big fan of that what I was a big fan of was manufacturing celebrity and I'll say this again because it is I can't I can't stress how big I think it personally is, Michael, in today's society because people are very influenced by what they see, read, and hear. 
And uh, on the radio shows, we wouldn't, we would advertise in a way where we said, we'll run ads on the radio, but we, we don't want a, our own show. We want to be part of the show. So we were on, you know, weekday shock jock radio shows. We were on sports radio shows, which will feel like a disconnect for people. Like, why would you be a, some financial person on a sports show? But we were on these shows and there's just a, hey, let us tell you what's going on in the money world in general. And it wasn't always about Roth IRA conversions, right? It was just talking in general about what's happening because in the end, there's only two reasons people did business 30 years ago, and there's only two reasons they do it today. People like you and they trust you. And so we spent quite a bit of money on, on uh, radio. I did not spend money on TV. I never spent a dollar on TV. Um, but I also learned how, how to do my own PR. And you may remember many years ago, you and I started with Harrow. I'm going to give somebody something great for people today called Use TMX. Um, it's used, it's US, yeah, U S E T M as in Mary and then X. And these are, these are, it's like the updated version of Harrow, Michael. It's a, it's a, it's a process where you get into the backside of the newsrooms and I find myself on TV, not just on your, your, your main stations, right. But as, as streaming grows, you know, I was on every week on like NBC LX and news nation is growing scripts, which used to be newsy. And you may say, well, I, I never heard of news nation. Well, news nation is probably the fifth or sixth largest news channel. And, and, you know, people are going to choose where they see the news, but that's not the big thing. See, people think if you go on those things, my, the phone is going to ring off the hook. That's not it. We became a master at repurposing content, Michael. Like every time I'd write a blog, I do a What Ted Says video, I get on TV. We're, we're in front of people all the time. And a lot of advisors think, well, I don't want to be in front of people all the time because they're going to get upset with me and not do business. It's exactly the opposite. Why do you think Progressive runs 8,000 commercials a week? You know, why, why does Liberty Mutual run that emu commercial? <laughs> you know, because yeah. they do it because they, it's so much that when you're in to make a buying decision, and in this case, either somebody who's looking for an advisor or changing advisors, we just want to be in the conversation. <clears throat> and we're in that conversation a lot more than other advisors in Atlanta. And that's how we, that's how we grow our assets. So, so a couple of, a follow on here I understand. So first the the site you mentioned you uh, TMX so yeah. so it sounds like so this is the updated version of Harrow I guess for those so who don't know so much better so much Har better. So Harrow was H A R O short for help a reporter out. Yeah. It was a service that got made I guess in like early mid 2000s yeah, where you, yeah, you and me both reporters who were looking for experts who were looking for sources would put out on Harrow like I'm doing an article about 529 plans. Who's an expert in 529 plans who can help me? And you could sign up for the the wow. Hero list and respond. And if you were one of the first people to respond, because they often get a bunch of responses, but if you were one of the first people to respond, like you could connect and say, I've got expertise on 529 plans. I'd love to to help you out with your story. And you would get an interview with a reporter or a chance to do a radio thing or a chance to do a TV thing. And so it led to a lot of media appearances. I think both you, you and I, Ted Hughes in the like late 2000s, early, early 2010s. So TMX, I guess, is, is the new version of that. So you, you, you sign up and then reporters who are looking for sources say like, I'm looking for an expert on blank. And if that's your thing, you could respond to them and, and try to participate. But it, it's a tighter, narrower circle. You know, Harrow's kind of become watered down with podcasters and people that write books and anonymous sources. TMX is at the heart of the newsrooms, right? Talking directly okay. to Fox, C CNBC, CNN. And when they want to get somebody on camera, like, you got to be ready now. I don't care if you have four appointments today or you don't. You got to be ready to get on camera now. You got to be ready to quote now. So this is part TV driven, part quote driven, but... It is, it is the best access that I've ever seen to the backside of newsrooms. And take it from a guy who I know the newsrooms. I, I did weekend headline news for nine years. So I, I know what they look like. Um, and it's, it's a tremendous source that I use today. And I still do, you know, I don't have clients anymore, but I still do eight to 10 TV hits a week. So, so that's part of what I was going to ask, like how much how many media appearances were you doing? I mean, for a lot of advisors, like 
we try to fit this stuff in somewhere or maybe like at some point, you know, I, I, a couple of months ago, like I got an interview thing with wall street journal, New York times, like that's a huge win for a lot of, for a lot of us. And, but you're talking about like, Oh yeah. And I did like eight, eight TV things a week. Yeah. So how is that? So how, just how much media stuff were you doing? I was on somewhere once a day. Now, tongue in cheek, you know, you're 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 probably 15 minutes in the waiting room waiting for the show to go. Your your news segment is all of, you know, 3 to 4 minutes and then it's over. So it's a half an hour. Um and, you know, people who need to prepare a lot for those segments, it's going to be difficult, right? But if you're pretty good on your feet and you actually do have knowledge, which most people say they do, um, then you don't do it, need to do as much research. So I, I did one yesterday on fantasy football, <laughs> fantasy football insurance, Michael. <laughs> and uh, it was just topical with, with, you know, football season starting and people saying, you know, how does that work? Do people actually buy fantasy football insurance? And we had a little dog and pony show for three minutes on national TV. It does take time, but you know, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? You know, are you an advisor or are you a marketer, right? Are you an asset gatherer, an asset manager? I would never claim on this podcast or anywhere else on this planet, Michael, to be the best asset manager that was out there. I'm sure people that are listening are 10 times better than me, but I was great at new business development, you know, and that's that's what I did. And that's what I was doing, All, you know, new business development. I was going to say, how how do you find time for that? Well, you know, it, it's a function of priorities, right? Um, you know, you have to decide what really makes the money in the business. I decided the highest paying job in America is marketing. So I, I spent as much time as I could with marketing, but it's also what got me to sell the practice because I got too weighted down and seeing people and, it, you know, I wanted to cut off my left toe. I loved doing the marketing. I just hated doing the rest. Interesting. And, and do you worry from the other end, like when you're, when you become such a, like a figurehead, visible person of the firm, like, does that create challenges or risks for the firm? Like, I, you know, I, I won't be able to sell this because the firm can't grow without me is, does that <laughs> well, become a fear? You know, in retrospect, um, there, here's the, here's the good and bad side to it, right? The, the good side is, <clears throat> that if you're really good at it, you can generate a crap load of leads uh, for the firm. The bad side is that if you choose from day one, you know, or, or day five or year five, that you're actually going to serve the clients that you bring in, that's when you're going to get crippled. That's where the quicksand comes in. So either be the marketer or be the advisor, but trying to be the marketer and be celebrity manufactured, right? And also be the advisor is a mistake. I made that mistake, Michael. <laughs> I did, you know, and I wouldn't have done it that way again. If I built it again, I just would have been the lead dog and been the marketer. Once the systems are built, <clears throat> you can sell the firm. I was running at five meetings a day, right? Call it 25 meetings a week. Literally, this is no joke. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll get you a picture of this. I set up a little bar in my office. <laughs> and and at the end of the day, it's like, what kind of cocktail am I pouring myself? Because I don't know what I did to myself here by taking on all these people. And it was destroying me. It was destroying every fabric of my life. I was completely miserable going home. It wasn't, I didn't love the business. I did. I just loved the front end of the business. Some advisors hate it. I loved it. I hated the rest. I hated it. Yeah. I mean, I'm struck by this for a lot of advisors. Like, Oh, I just wish I could hang with my clients and not have to do all that marketing stuff. It's so draining. So I'm fascinated. You were like the 180 degree <laughs> polar opposite. Like you just wanted to get out there and keep driving the growth and doing the media work because that was fun. It was driving so much results and it was the client, it was the client activity that was dragging you down. But you had a lot of advisors in the firm, right? What prevented you from getting the clients over to those clients, shifting the clients, those uh, uh, advisors, and just trying to get the clients to just do the meetings with your other advisors and not you. You know, here, this will be maybe shocking to people, Michael, or not. I realize after a while, I'm a, I'm a great marketer and I'm great at developing new business. I feel like I could do it toe to toe with anybody in the country. In the end, I don't know if I was the greatest business operator, Michael. You know what I'm saying? Mm. I, I just don't know if I was the best at it. And honestly, I hated managing people. I really did. 
um, then holding people accountable. And even though I had operations people in there, it was a lot. I was completely burnt out. I was not having the kind of fun I wanted to. I would get a moment of fresh air when I do one of the TV hits or go on the radio because I just, I totally, it's like being a comedian, right? I get on stage and I, the adrenaline rush is huge and I loved it. I love that adrenaline rush. And then I'd come back to real life, Michael, and I would be like, oh my God, do I live here? Is this my house? You know, uh, I don't, I don't even want to be here. And, um, you know, I didn't want to hurt the firm, right? I didn't want to hurt the right. people. I mean, I have great people. We had great clients. It wasn't anything about that. And, um, you know, that's, that's what caused me to get down this path of thinking, you know, yeah, how, how can I exit out of this thing? Cause it's just, I'm not having fun. So, so then what came next? Like just in practice, how do you queue up? Well, like, so I think I might want to sell my, my multi-billion dollar firm. And so I feel like I'm putting context, like at a point that I'm assuming some people wouldn't expect you because you're you're a young guy. Like, can I ask how, how old are you now? Well, I'm in my early 50s now, but it was at the time I was in my late 40s. Yeah, yeah. I was young, dude. And it's, yeah, I still, so, feel like, you know, still feel like I'm in my prime, but yeah. you know. So a lot of advisors do this like well into their 60s, into their 70s. <laughs> I've seen a few go into their 80s right now. So yeah, like how, how do you start queuing up a... I'm thinking about selling this mm, 20 to 30 years earlier than some other advisors might have done this transaction. You know, I, I think um, for, for everybody, you, you have to decide like why you're building the practice, right? Is this practice going to be a, a lifestyle business where you golf four days a week and you make 500 grand and you work nine to three? Or I know some people take the summers off in the business. It could just be that kind of business. I I have always been an entrepreneur by nature and the nature of having licenses like people that are licensed with FINRA I know some people are not you know when your license is a series 7 Michael it really is it's completely the antithesis of being an entrepreneur right because every time you fill out an outside business activity you you basically you're on death row right and so uh, that becomes I, a challenge in in the regulated context like every new entrepreneurial endeavor is an outside business activity and i guess every even worse every time you invest into a business or transaction to business you have like private securities transaction disclosures yeah, that now you're, you're talking now, now you're dealing in unregistered securities like no like i'm starting a business like you're dealing in unregistered securities that's a fun compliance conversation yeah and so um it's not true for all people that are in our business but i think for people that are diehard entrepreneurs especially those that carry a series 7 not people that may be pure ria it's a challenge be because um, you because you were bd affiliated in the yeah. in in this context yes okay. yeah because i was bd affiliated every like 3 weeks i'd be submitting another oba i had someone to call me from compliance like this is your, we've run out of room in your U4. You know, <laughs> we don't have any more room in, we don't have any more room anymore in your Turns U4. Turns out there's only so many line items of OBAs they can fit. <laughs> yeah, I, that's a true story. You know, I had some <laughs> compliance person ask me, they said, you know, we're running out of room on your U4. I'm like, what does that mean? They go, well, you only get so many characters in your U4 to, <laughs> to write outside business activities and you've run out of them. And they're like, how do you possibly have this much bandwidth to do all these things? And, um, you know, I found it, I found it um, frustrating, Michael, to have to explain myself all the time. It's like, you know, just some of us are able to do more things and some of us not. And the mundane day-to-day -day thing with clients was difficult. I, I had a bunch of good G2s in my office, but frankly, the business got too big to really sell it out and get my cash out as quick as I would have liked with other people in the firm. Okay. And um, because if you're doing this with next generation advisors, when you're when you're billions of dollars, I mean, you, you know, they they can air quotes like they can afford it if you just finance it over like 10 plus years and take on seller financing risk and all that. Uh, but then you're hanging around seven to 10 years and hoping that everything really goes smoothly to to get your dollars out when there are other buyers that do mostly upfront payments now. Yeah. Well, there's a whole number of ways, but you know, I didn't really know that much about it. And uh, I, I don't know how I would have actually approached it at that time, but um, you know, by, by fate or by luck, you know, whatever it may be, 
I think this was in the end of 2018 or early 2019, a big private equity firm called Warburg Pincus. Most people probably know Warburg. They bought or they bought most or all, I can't remember what it was, but probably most of it of the broker dealer Kestra. I think at the time they owned Grove Point, not anymore, and, a, and something called the Arden Trust Company. And then they developed their own M&A firm called Blue Spring Wealth Partners. And uh, obviously, you know, the CEO was great. And I was at a conference with him in early 2019. And I said, look, I'm looking at selling this. And he, they're like, well, maybe you could be our first transaction. And I thought, great. <laughs> you know, and great. I was always because under it's, the- It's right there under the BD. It literally, Warburg wants to fund this to do transactions. Like that's- right. a about as perfect of a like no no repapering yeah. Up, right yeah no no repapering it's already in the system no change of brand name no nothing but you got to realize you know this is ted jenkin at the time like pretty clueless about how all this exactly should work and my you know all the years that i looked at fb transitions or you know succession link or talked to other advisors there's always been this and i know it's changed over time that like maybe you could get two to three times recurring revenue. Maybe it's one time on commission revenue. And I kind of had that in, in my head. And as I went through this, this negotiation process with Blue Spring and, and Warburg, it was so it was so interesting to me because here's what I here's what I never thought about. And this may be crazy for financial advisors when I say this, but I never it never dawned on me, Michael, it never dawned on me. If somebody said to you today, I'm going to pay you 10 times cash flow for your planning practice, you might go, wow, that's that's crazy. How are you going to make your money back, right? That's the question we ask all the time. How are you going to make your money back? And what I didn't ever really think about is the word arbitrage, meaning that a private equity company that has substantially more revenue or substantially higher amount of assets would trade at a higher multiple than my individual practice. And it seems simple as I'm saying it now, but most advisors don't, they don't think about it that way. They buy another advisor's practice. They go, I wonder if I could make my cash flow back in three and a half years if I do this and that. And and they don't, these companies don't think that way. So the multiple which I can't disclose on here, let's just say it was substantially higher than a three X on revenue was the most significant transaction I ever made in my life ever. It was life changing, not have to work again type transaction. And it, it opened up my eyes and thinking, geez, I thought I was a reasonably smart guy, but maybe there's a lot of this I really don't understand. And I started thinking, Michael, if I don't understand it, I mean, I wonder how many people in this industry do understand it. And and that that's how that whole thing went down. And I sold on July 1 of 2019. So, all right. So a couple of things I want to, I want to understand here. First, the, uh, the, the nature of this, uh, our arbitrage, like I just want to make sure we're clear for people who are listening. So this is the, the idea of, a PE firm might come in and say, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll buy your firm at 10 times cash flow because you're generating X dollars of, of profit. So I guess, can I ask like what, what revenues and, and profits or what revenues and margins looked like for you guys at the point that you were selling? We were in the 40% range on margins, but a lot, a lot of people will run 50% on their practice. But let's just say to keep this simple that you were doing, you know, 10 million of, of, uh, revenue and you were doing 4 million of profit, right? Okay. 40%. On 4 million of profit, if you got paid 12 times cash flow, it would be 48 million, right? right. And it's not going to be 48 million at close. There are definitely some bells and whistles and, and hooks to it, but nothing that that's that crazy in general, right? And I start thinking, you, you pay me $48 million. How the hell do you make back your money? But, you know, if I'm a firm with, with $2 billion, let's say, and the firm that's buying me has $20 billion, their multiple, if they resold, might be at 18 times cash flow already. A good example of this, Michael, is that recently CI, which is a big firm in our industry, 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think Bain and Company, and this was in CityWire, they they uh, took out 20% of CI and the multiple, which was published, was at 25.6 on EBITDA. 25.6 on EBITDA. So if you buy me for 12 and you're able to go resell at 25.6, are you really worried yeah, about- you, you, you literally doubled your money without growing the thing you bought at all. Literally just because someone else would would pay more for a bigger thing. That that is what advisors need to get into their head. Like that is the world that we're in today. Goldman just sold uh their business to creative planning, right? Yep. And well, I, I don't think the multiples were published, and I'm sure Goldman got a good multiple, but I'm a hundred percent sure that there was some delta between creatives multiple and Goldman's multiple, right? It had right. to be that way. That's why they acquired them. And and that, you know, whether creative, you know, resells down the road or they go public, I have no idea. But I but I will say that there was some arbitrage in that multiple, no question about it. So indirectly to me, this also helps highlight just the sheer impact that margins have. Cause you know, like you are you are running at 40% margins. And I mean, I have seen other firms that are are there even a little bit higher. But if you look at uh, like investment news benchmarking studies and such, most firms at size are still running 25 to 35-ish percent margins. Yep. Like at, you know, the average is more like 30 or really high 20s. And some are even a little bit lower than that. So, you know, if you're if you're running at 22% margins, 10 times cash flow is, in your example, like that's 2.2 million of profit. That's a $22 million valuation on 10 million of revenue. So you're you're getting about 2.2 times revenue. If you're running uh, a $4 million profit and you're getting 10x earnings, you're getting a $40 million valuation or 4x revenue. And so like same, uh, you know, the the when the deal at the end of the day gets struck on profits because that's really how it gets done we talk about revenue as a shorthand yeah people buy cash flows uh in financial buyers buy cash flows uh, to me like that that's the other thing i think often doesn't get understood and appreciated a lot when you see see headlines of like wow that firm got got bought for more than three times revenue like well actually that may just be because they were running 35 percent profit margins right and that's what you know, quote unquote drove up their multiple because the reality is like they got the exact same multiple of free cash flow a lot of others are getting. But if you literally have a higher profit margin, then when you multiply times your profits, like it's a much bigger multiple in yeah. revenue. Yeah. And I'll give you a couple of quick insights on on my deal that I, I can talk about that I think are are interesting in general. First of all, the advisors that are out there that are like, I run a 80% margin because I work out of my house and I do a million of gross and I make 800 grand a year. That's a great business for you, but nobody's going to buy it in this sense that when you want to sell them the 800000 of cash flow, you actually have to hire somebody to work in the business. And so a lot of those advisors are unrealistic about what they're building. Mm-hmm. Number two- I mean, my, Just to be fair, like someone will buy that. Like it is a good amount of free cash flow, but just you're, you're, not, you're not getting valued on your 800 net no because way. the buyer- doesn't get that net because the buyer's got to hire someone else to do your right, job, which right. means they're granted not the worst in the world. Like they're they're only going to net five hundred or six hundred, but they're you know they're going to value you on the five to six hundred net they think they can do, not the eight hundred you're taking home. Because really, part of that is your profits, and part of that is just the salary you didn't bother to pay yourself. Because who cares when it's your business? But buyers do that math. My my biggest fear doing the deal, and some people may feel this way, is when they said, well, you got to become an employee. And I thought, gulp. <laughs> you know, uh, am I going to have to wear a tie to work again? Or, or am I going to have, uh, you know, one-on-ones every week to talk about what I did this week? You know, am I going to have to report a whole bunch of numbers? And it really freaked me out. It was probably the one thing that I thought, maybe I'm not going to do this, right? Because I don't want to work for anybody again. But what I realized into this thing is that that these financial buyers, they don't want to run your business. They 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 want to give you money to pour gas on what you're good at, and they want to, you know, poke and prod you like a doctor to figure out where it hurts and give you solutions to solve those problems, right? 
And uh, at most, Michael, I had a once a month call to go through my financials to see how we were doing. And that was about it. Nobody was talking to me about my wealth management strategies or other things like that, unless I wanted to talk about it. So but, that was a that was a big um, aha for me because I was I was freaked out about that, man. But I bet help me understand. I thought the whole queue up of the transaction in the first place was you wanted out. So yeah, why'd you take an employee gig on the other end versus like, hey guys, I'm so glad you want to play buy my business here. Take it. <laughs> so let me let me Peace explain. Out. Let me explain this um, to everyone. And Michael, since you're the financial genius, you'll understand this better than anybody. If you want to sell your business and get out tomorrow, you're going to do it at a discounted valuation, right? So if you say that your business is worth ten million dollars and you want out today, I'm making this up, but somebody might pay you seven, right? Because they got risk. If you believe that you're good at what you do and you can grow it, when you negotiate a deal, and this is the one thing I did that was smart. You can negotiate air in the hot air balloon. And here's what I mean by that. I could say to somebody, which is what I did in this case with, with Blue Spring, is I said, look, I think I can grow this thing. They said, well, why don't you stick around for three years, make a full transition of all the clients that you don't want to work with anymore. We'll free you up to do all the marketing. And that's all that you'll have to worry about doing. And if you can grow at a Kager level, compounded annual growth rate, of 5% a year compounded, irrespective of the markets, make the markets neutral, we'll pay you this much more. If you can do it 10%, this much more, but if you can grow by 20% and basically ring the, ring the uh, bell, we'll pay you a lot of money. And I thought, you know what? I'm a great marketer. If you free me up from this other stuff, I can totally ring that bell. And, and that, that's why I stuck around for three years after I sold as an employee, because if I rang the bell, it meant even more money for me at the end. And, the, and then you're out, out with a bigger check having done a, yeah. a post-transaction search. Yeah. yeah. And so I'm, I'm presuming then like the, the, the payment, well, I mean, obviously the payments get bigger if you grow at like 10 instead of five, because literally compounding 10 is more money. Right. But, uh, was it literally like the, the, the multiple on that growth was better. Yes. Like you get, you get, you don't just get more money because it's bigger. You get a better multiple on that money. That's, a, that's exactly, if that's you, exactly if you make right. That, if you make that growth as well. That's exactly right. And I got to tell you something. I'm nine months into this deal, Michael. And you know what hits us in March of 2020? COVID. I was going to say, like you sold this in, you said July 1st of 2019. Yeah. So the nine world months really later, different, nine to 12 months later. <laughs> COVID hits, the market goes down in that month, something like 35%. I go home and I cry. I literally, I don't remember the last time I cried and I cried and I thought, what did I do? I'm never, I don't care how good I do. I'm not going to be able to recover from a 35% market hit. And it's probably not going to rebound like anytime fast. And, and obviously, you know, I'm going to say I got charmed lucky that it rebounded like it did. Um, you know, but that's the risk that you take, you know, when you get into these things, because you can't get a deal in general, you go, well, protect me on the downside. Meaning if the market goes down by 20%, I want to be protected, but I want the upside if the market goes up by 20%, right? You can't, you can't have your cake and eat it too. So were the growth targets that you had to hit this, like, can you grow a 20% compound growth rate for three years? Was that just on the on the overall assets and revenue base, was that it's specifically? All it was all EBITDA driven. It was all it was, EBITDA driven. Oh, it was grow the it was grow the EBITDA. So, yep. uh, so you could make this from markets or from organic growth, but in the classic sense that we all live with advisory firms, there's nothing that sucks more than having to pay a hundred percent of your salaries while the market tanks. Yeah, because and it obliterate <clears throat> it obliterates your your earnings because all the market drop goes straight, comes straight out of the bottom line because your staff still has to get paid when you're going through a bear market. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and then you, as you said it, all these finan buyers are end up being financial buyers one way or the other. So they really all look at cash flow, which is why, listen, anybody that's listening to this, you know, if you don't have like a clean set of books and you can't produce them quickly and you can't, 
do what's called to be redacted financials, meaning you can't quickly put your ad backs back into the business, you ought to clean it up today. I don't care if you're not ready to sell for 15 years because you're going to have to put that together. And the cleaner that stuff looks, the faster a deal will go. Wait, so can you explain that for folks that are not familiar? So let's say somebody on here doing $2 million of revenue, and you know, you're, you're, at least today you say you make a million dollars, but the tax returns that you send to the government say you make a half million dollars, right? Um, you know, you're going to have to explain that. <laughs> and, and so, you know, some people have a set of books and they bury their Lamborghini, they put their kids on payroll, their partner or spouse is on payroll, they put the sporting tickets. And some of those things may be true business expenses. I'm not going to say that people on here put untrue business expenses, Michael, in their P&L, but I'm betting they do. And eventually you're going to have to explain that because a buyer wants to buy cash flow. So if you're doing uh, your financial, you get, this, you get this problem where you take things like I'm, I'm running my, I'm running my car through the business for tax purposes, right. but I'm not really reflecting that way in my business profitability. Cause like, I, I know it's my car. Uh, and so you get these gaps between what you're claiming the profitability of the firm is and what you're telling Uncle Sam. And so any financial buyer is going to come in and say, "I these numbers don't match. Can you explain and reconcile these numbers? <laughs> yeah. So my recommendation is whether you're using you know, a professional service or you're doing QuickBooks yourself or FreshBooks or, or whatever it is, run your books the way you're running it, but also at the end of the year – um, try to do a set of what, what I call to be redacted financials or however, whatever you want to call it, try to put the ad backs of what they really are. So you can figure out what the true cash flow is in the business. Cause financial buyers are reasonable. You can explain some things away and some things you may not be able to, no matter how hard you try. So, um, you know, just realize that, that when you sell it, you're going to have to prove it. And, and so this is, this is classically the just, the stuff people route through their business that maybe they're doing a little bit more for tax purposes than, than bona fide yeah. business. So, you know, fa family member, family member comp, I generously put through the business, the cars, the occasional sports tickets that are mostly entertainment air quotes, like that, that kind of stuff is what you're talking about. Yeah. Most advisors put all their travel period in the business. A lot of them do. I'm not saying all, but a lot do all your meals and entertainment, you know, and in the end, when a buyer says, Oh, wow, you got $30,000 a year, Michael and meals and entertainment. It's like, no, no, it's not that way. I just, I, I put my family stuff on there. Well, which part was your family stuff and which part is the stuff that actually relates to clients? Cause I got to know what I'm buying, right? I got to know what I'm buying. Which I guess in, in, in the advisor context, like this, this generally is going to get you better results because you're going to start backing expenses out of the business that probably shouldn't be there and actually show better profitability, which is good when you're getting bought on a multiple of profits, a multiple of earnings. Yeah. And I will say that most buyers, and this is including the one that I went through, I mean, we've always heard this story, like you need five years of financials, which is, is not true at all. Um, most financial buyers right now would want to see last year and this year. And what happened prior to that is not that relevant unless you're really proving out how fast you've grown top line revenue. Like you have a marketing engine that grows top line revenue. And, you know, the l last year and this year is mostly what matters. Because they're just trying to understand where your profitability is because the irony is they may not necessarily need you to grow all that much because they're making a lot of their money on the multiple, the size, multiple arbitrage, not actually your growth. Like they do need the profitability, but they're not as reliant on growing the profitability because they're trying to make their money on the multiple arbitrage. Yeah, and, and if you're fee-based and let's say you're billing quarterly, your, your, your business is kind of only as good as like last quarter's billables, right? You know, if right. you annualize it out, you could look at the last trailing 12 months, which is the last four quarters, right? Which could rise and fall with the market. But to a degree, the last quarter of billings, if you annualize it out, is kind of where your business is, right? Right, right. So, so is that ultimately just how the transaction went? Like you, you cut the deal, uh, you had a three year hang around, grow, grow earnings 20% a year for, uh, for three years, right? Shift all the clients off of you so you can free up your time to do that. And then summer of 2022, you'll hit the three year mark and you're free. 
right off into the sunset, baby. <laughs> and so is that how it played out in and, practice? Yeah, it you know it did. They asked me to do a little bit of consulting work after, which I which I did with the uh, with the team just to make sure everything was you know, massaging, right. Um, obviously I care, I care and still care about the brand. It's something reputable I built here in Atlanta. Um, but you know, what it really allowed me to do is basically drop my licenses and the things that you were mentioning earlier, getting involved in different kinds of things that given my licenses and, and the conflict of interest I might've had in, in dealing with clients personally and running the firm professionally, I didn't have to worry about it anymore. So I could start to do other things. So what became some of the other things? <laughs> well, here's the craziest, craziest part about this. Some people who are listening might have seen the movie Jerry Maguire, right? The show me the money. And um, I had a friend of mine that, you know, in a lot of cities and even professionally, we have what I would call to be coopetition, you know, people that you compete with, but you're still friendly. And I had a friend of mine that was in downtown Alpharetta, Georgia, and he had heard that, you know, I did a transaction and um, I met with him and he said, hey, man, he's like, do you think you could help me do this? And I was like, I got, I don't have any idea. You know, I just kind of figured it out for myself. And uh, I, I actually started to help him figure out and, you know, consult him on how to do one of these transactions. And I ended up helping him, you know, get a transaction, not with the firm that I went with, but he did it with another firm. And um, this thing, Michael, just kind of morphed into a, a full, not I would say a full-time job, but, you know, a job starting to be a Jerry Maguire, you know, a, a consultant to help advisors figure out the landscape um, and be able to maximize the deal that best suited their practice, almost like a fiduciary for financial advisors for selling their practices. So, and so that's now become the focus is now uh, you've gone from sold my firm to deal consultant for other advisors selling their firms. <laughs> well, I'm an entrepreneur, so I'm doing a lot of things, <laughs> um, but, but that has become a really cool focus because for me, remember what I said, I don't, I don't want to manage people. So I don't really have to manage people doing that. I don't have any clients that I have to serve per se, except the ones that I'm helping. Once I'm done they, with the transaction, okay, I have once you're done with the transaction, they move on. They don't, yeah. you, don't you don't have to keep serving them for the next 10, 20, 30 yeah, years. I'm, I'm not sitting down every quarter talking about their tomato garden and the markets, um, so I don't have to do that anymore. And I, I mean, over the course of the last few years, I've been involved or looked at probably 60 different firms deals. Okay. And so I almost feel like Michael now that, that I'm a human Zillow when it comes to the, what's a financial advisor's practice worth. That's just the way I would describe it because, I've seen so many of these that it's, you know, they're not all baked the cake the same way, but it's, it's, there's many, many firms that are in the business of acquisition. So, all right. So, so what's the, so what's the consulting business now? Like just so people know, it's like, what's this yeah, called? It's, it's re real simple. I mean, you know, it looks like a real estate agent. That's the easiest way to explain it. You know, I, I list your home. And we make a success fee if we sell the home successfully. If we don't sell it, we make nothing. No retainers, no hourly rates. You know, I mean, I I don't need the money per se. So I'd rather I'd rather bet on helping you get the best deal for your practice. And we we get the most upside if we can sell it for the most amount of money, assuming the culture fit makes sense. And and how does that work in practice? Like that means there's basically a, a percentage of the value that gets struck as a as a yeah. uh, a success fee you're you're asking a very important question right because when you look at a deal you'll hear these terms like an all-in offer right the all-in offer was x right but what we we get paid for is the consideration for the business meaning if your business does two million of revenue and somebody says i'll buy the business for 10 million keep this simple we're getting paid on the 10 million. But if you choose to stay, which a lot of people do, there may be ongoing compensation or stock or another bite of the apple or retirement packages. We don't, we're not making money on that. We're getting paid to basically sell the house, right? And that's that's what we do. 
Okay, so if you know, if I end up with I'm, well, I'm I'm gonna get I'm gonna get twelve million dollars out of this deal because I'm I'm selling it for ten million dollars, but then I get a a, a two hundred fifty thousand dollar continuation contract for the next eight years because I'm fifty seven yeah. and I want to be out at sixty five. Like you're you're not getting paid on the twelve, which has like eight years of comp afterwards. You're getting paid on the check that's getting written for the that's enterprise. right. That's right. And, and and can I ask, like, what is that percentage? Like, how do you, you know? How they, do you calculate that? <laughs> it ranges. In my world, you know, I do this and and I take risks. So a smaller practice could be on the the higher end. It could be at ten percent. Uh, a bigger practice could be could be lower. I don't think I've ever done a deal for less than four percent. And uh, and just in your world, like, what is what is smaller practice? What is bigger practice i mean it's like no. I don't know, that's like a 50 million dollar firm yeah. and a 500 million dollar firm that's no. like a, a billion dollar practice, firm and a 10 billion dollar firm sm- small practice is anything sub 1 million of revenue okay <laughs> right um if you're between 100 million and a billion that's a really good practice to sell there's a lot of appetite for that at the billion dollar level where we were and where other firms are it becomes a more sophisticated game Right. And, and our, you know, the fees may be less, but it's just a more sophisticated game. There's not that many billion dollar firms that are out there. There's a lot of firms between a hundred million and a billion. Okay. And so that's kind of the, it sounds like that's the sweet spot where you tend to live is that like hundred million to a billion. So yeah. proverbial 1%, like I'm a, I'm a one to one to 10 million revenue enterprise. That's a, that's a great, great, great practice. That's exactly right. I'd say 5 million of revenue is in that real sweet spot. And, and so, so then help us understand the, the role that you play or the, the services mm. that you guys are, mm. are providing, right? So if I say like Ted, you know, yeah, I got a $600 million practice. I'm doing about four and a half million dollars of, um, uh, uh, of top line revenue. like. I think I want to be out. Like, what do you what do you do for me exactly? Yeah. So you know, if you think about it, um, everybody on here at some point that has a practice that's growing, or even if it's not growing that much, you're going to get some email from some private equity firm or somebody saying, "Hey, are you interested in selling your business?" Forget about advisor to advisor, and you might take a meeting or two and try to compare and contrast those deals, but. You'll never really know you're getting the best deal because you don't have other advisors' deals to compare it against. So what I'm doing is is that I think I've got 60 buyers now, <clears throat> and and I'll look at those 60 buyers and let's say Michael hires me on. You know, we'll get you in front of let's just say 10 buyers to start because the truth is, if it's not a culture fit, it doesn't matter how much money you're going to get for the practice, you know, you've got to, you've got to still think is, is your firm a culture fit? Will it work for the employees in the company? You know, is this going to be good for your clients? And you also need to think about what things are non-negotiable. You know, some people don't want to give up their brand. Some people don't want to give up the reins on asset management. And it's like, what, what things would you be willing to give up and, and what don't you want to give up? And you also need to be thinking, do I want to sell all the firm and stick around? Do I want to just do a minority deal and de-risk and and do something else down the road? These are all initial questions. So we, Michael, we take on a client. We try to help them flesh through those questions. Think about an intake form that a financial planning client would take on. And we we help uh, build out sort of that profile. And then we go put them in front of, call it 10 buyers or so for a first date. Right. So you're so basically like you're you're sourcing all these introductions. You've got your Everyone own proverbial them. Rolodex of firms that are buyers that would be interested in a firm at your size that uh, at least are a decent shot at being a reasonable uh, fit. So it's worth the first first conversation, first introduction, and that's those are all introductions you guys facilitate. We we make it, we go on the first meetings with the uh, with the client. Uh, we're on every meeting with the client, in fact. And um, then what we do, and, and some people that are, are financial planning for business owners will, will uh, understand the term, a Q of E report, like a quality of earnings report. And we'll go through and look at the financials and our team will help build a set of redacted financials with the ad backs. If if they haven't if the advisor hasn't done it already, which most of them have not, uh, some of them don't have books all together, and and so we've got to construct those because every buyer is going to want to see a set of books. So we we got to get the books cleaned up, 
uh, get them in good shape. And then, you know, once we have the meeting and the NDAs in place with the buyers, uh, we're going to go give them a set of financials. And sometimes we put together what's called to be a SIM, a confidential information memorandum. Think about it like a 10 page, you know, here's the great stuff about the practice and what you're buying. And you may have seen this for business owners. If you've ever had a client as a business owner or sold before. And, um, you know, a lot of times the advisors will want to learn more about some firms than the others. And there may be meetings with their investment committees or their financial planning departments or taking a look at the tech stacks to see what will integrate and what won't. And then, you know, hopefully if all that's productive, we get to what's called to be an IOI or an LOI, an indication of interest or a letter of interest. And from there, you know, I say it's let the games begin, you know, because we know the marketplace. We we try to negotiate the air and the balloon. Uh, number one, the consideration, Michael. Number two, what the ongoing compensation will look like for the advisor predicated on how long they want to stay. And if they're going to stay a little bit longer, we like to negotiate another bite of the apple, right? And, um, you know, we, we get paid to try to negotiate that deal so we can get our clients the very best deal uh, for their firm. So I think for most folks, like the... The consideration I get paid when I sell is pretty straightforward. Ongoing compensation for the advisor. If I stay, I understand. Can you explain more like an, what is another bite at the apple? Mean so so that know? can work in a number of ways. Uh, one example is that some of these firms, you know, have their own private stock, right? And, uh, you know, one deal what we negotiated is we said, look, um, the advisor is going to get paid a certain amount of compensation to run the practice. But, you know, what's the real incentive for the advisor to grow EBITDA if it's not in the consideration of the deal, right? Not that much. So we might say, look, if the advisor, if the EBITDA of the business is $2 million and the advisor over five years grows it to $3 million, we, we want another slug of stock in the private equity company, right? That would be an example. A different example is we negotiated one deal where we said if the advisor works for five years, we want a five-year retirement package of 50% of their W-2 income, meaning that if W-2 income they, they started with was a half million, Michael, and it grew to a million dollars after five years, they would get a five-year exit pension, if you will, or payments of 500 grand a year because that's 50% of a million for having grown the value of the business, right? That's an example of a second bite of the apple. So how big is your team? So right, right now, we've got nine people on the team. Um, there, are, there are four other very seasoned 30-year-plus financial executives that are on the team that have been in and around the block you know, a long time. There are analysts on the team because remember, we have to run these financial reports. We've got to do research. We're, we're constantly interviewing new partners that we think could be fits for our clients. Obviously, some people may only want a fee-only partner and they don't want to have, if they can't use the term fee-only, they're not going to want to go with them, right? And some people um, you know, are, are going to want to deal with uh, certain brand names that we see in Barron's list all the time. And we deal with a bunch of those companies. And um, there are some buyers out there, you know, you, you might've mentioned this in the beginning, but I'll give you a good example. Like not, not many people may have heard of the Pagula family and they own the Buffalo Bills and the Buffalo Sabres. And a lot of these wealthy families are creating family offices that invest in a number of things, but as a capital partner, a bunch of them are getting into the financial services business. So, you know, sometimes they end up just being capital partners and not really the RIA per se, right? Or how we think about it. But, you know, we're constantly looking for, for where the capital is, Michael, because here's what a lot of advisors don't understand. <clears throat> it's not just about the firm. There's also the reason we're so good at what we do is that we we follow the money, right? You know, when a firm, uh, you know, Stone Point Capital gives a firm two hundred fifty million dollars, or Bain invests four hundred million dollars, well, well, that that company's got to do something with that four hundred million dollars. So they may be more apt, uh, irrespective of interest rates, to to dial up the multiple because they want to put the capital to work, right? right? That's not things that advisors think about every day, and it's not things that they're following. And and what's the business called? I don't think we've actually 
Oh, the, the business is called it's it. Well, it's not really a great name like Oxygen. That was a good one, but it's called J P as in Paul T D Partners. J P T D Partners. You 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 gonna rename that? Yeah, I, I probably will. I probably will at some point. You know, it wasn't. Here's the funny thing: this wasn't supposed to be a business. It was like just something that was going to be like a little hobby, but like, I think I don't know how to do hobby. I really don't. Uh Um, I'm like you, you're never going to settle down. Um, You know, it just kind of the way we're built. So am I going to have to rename it? Yeah, I'm going to have to rename it. It's not a great name. It just doesn't roll (laughs) roll off the tongue well. So I guess for folks who missed that, like this is episode 364. So if you go to kitsis.com slash 364, we'll have a a link out to JPTD partners. It's like the... The letters don't roll off the tongue. No, well. no, it's not, tongue, it's, 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 it's not a great. It's not a branding name, Michael. <laughs> A-T-T-D. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, um, you know, it wasn't what we weren't, it wasn't built for that. Now, I think we represent somewhere in the nature of 115 advisors right now. In, in like various deal stages. Yeah. That's a yeah. lot of active deals. It's it's insane. Um, you know, I think we're. I don't know how many firms even have a specialty to do that. We don't do anything else but that, Michael. That's all we do. And uh, it's. I think it's a really unique thing in our business because you know, as you mentioned, it's scary, man. You know, you got you built your whole life doing this, and you might not do it again. You could. But it's a it's a it's a real bear to go build a financial advisory wealth management practice. And so you want to you know, I'm not saying don't sell to your friend down the block. You can do it if you feel like that's what's best for your clients. You're just never going to command the highest multiples for it. Never. So. So then share with us more just as you're doing this. You now, like huge volume of deals, you had said earlier, there's, there's just, there's all these questions that advisors don't even know to ask. Like, what are you, uh, what do you see? What are you learning that, that well, advisors need to know and hear about and be aware yeah. of and how this works? Let, let's be clear that you kind of uh, hinted around this in the beginning. Every firm may have a different way that they value the business. So you want to be asking, are you valuing my business on revenue? Some of them, Michael, will value it on the term EBOC, okay? And really what I think about is if you don't pay yourself a salary, which there are a lot of advisors on their P&Ls, Michael, that don't pay themselves much of a salary, maybe enough to suffice the IRS if they do that at all. And then there, you know, that's kind of the cash flow to the owner in the business. And then there's EBITDA, and and every firm has a slightly different way that they calculate EBITDA, right? E- they may say, in the P&L, we're going to demand that you put in a $250,000 salary for a senior partner, and that's going to help us get to EBITDA. They're going to say, we have all these platform costs at our firm to run technology, et cetera, et cetera, and no matter what your P&L is, we need to bake those in there to get to EBITDA. So in the end, you need to be clear about what exactly it is that you're selling because somebody could tell you, I'm going to pay you a multiple of eight. And somebody says, I'll pay you a multiple of 10, but it really doesn't matter unless you know what number it is that the multiple is being paid on. Because the first firm says, I'll pay you, I'll pay you 8X your earnings. The second firm says, I'll pay you 10X your earnings. Oh, but by the way, we're going to be doing some adjustments to your earnings before we do that. We're going to be tagging in different salaries for the partners, and uh, we're going to require you to take on some costs for tech that we use that you're going to be required to use. And when we get through all of that, 10x your adjusted earnings number is certainly not 10x whatever you were looking at as your earnings. And ironically, it might not even be as high as the other firm that was willing to pay 8x, but they were paying 8x what you actually have on your P&L. Yeah, that's right. And, and, um, you know, when these deals are done, okay, this gets to the next question. Mo- most of the companies don't really want to do an all cash deal. I'll tell people that up front. If you're doing a full deal, a lot of them want you to take stock in their company. And so you want to be asking questions like, uh, number one, does the stock pay dividends or does it not? Some of these companies, the stocks will pay dividends and some don't. Um, you know, on, on mine, when I did my Michael, it didn't pay dividends, but then Warburg Pincus, Blue Spring Wealth Partners made a one-time massive dividend distribution. That was a win. Some of them do pay ongoing dividends. 
Uh, two, you may ask, and you should ask, how do I get liquidity? Because a lot of the deal decks that they'll show you will say, our stock has grown at a 30% CAGR over the last five years. If you take 20% in stock, you're going to have $8 million in five years. It's like, well, that all looks good on paper, but how do I get liquid? And in some cases, it can be very, very difficult to get liquid. And in some cases, you can only get liquid when they do a recapitalization or another equity partner, you know, takes a position or they may tell you we're making a run to go public, you know, and that may or may not happen. Right. So these are important questions to ask because everything looks good on a PowerPoint right. <clears throat> until you actually have to figure out a way to get your your dollars out. So that's a good inflection point or questions you want to be asking. So what else? Just this, okay, this so is, the earn out is important. No one's going to pay you 100% cash at close. Okay, that's just my my view. And I've seen a lot of these. So the question is, what does the earn out look like? Uh, some earn outs, Michael, are, are predicated on revenue retention, and never on like the client list. It's revenue retention. And then the question is, well, is it 100% of revenue, revenue retention? Is it 90%? And then what do I lose if I don't hit it? Meaning some companies, you lose part of the payment. Some companies go back to the full purchase price, and then they do a reduction of that payment based upon the full purchase price. So you really need to ask that if I don't hit the numbers, what am I really losing and how's that number calculated? And if I hit way above it, do I get something more? Um, and if they give you Kager numbers, what are the Kager numbers or the Kager hurdles based upon? Because to get paid a higher multiple, uh, a lot of times you're going to have to hit some growth hurdles. And is that predicated on revenue? Is it on EBOC or EBITDA? You know, the, these are good examples of, of questions that you want to ask. If you're getting paid ongoing compensation, is it a payout? And, and is the payout different on legacy business than it is on new business? If it's a salary plus bonus, is the bonus a flat bonus? Is the bonus based upon EBITDA? Do you participate in that? Or is it on a growth of EBITDA? These are the kind of questions you want to be asking when you start constructing a deal. And and in practice, how how negotiable are these? Like, can I can I move a bunch of these levers if I don't like them, or is it more of this is how firm A does it, and this and firm B does it differently? But like, if, you know, if you like a certain deal structure, you're probably just going to have to go with B because that's just not a how A does their stuff. So I'd like to say at the get go that, um, you know, everything's negotiable, right? Um, but it's kind of hard to know what you're levering up against to negotiate if you've never seen anything else, right? So imagine a firm offers Michael 10 times cash flow. And you're like, well, I wonder if I can get 11. And you go, well, how about 11 times cash flow? And they go, okay, but you got to sign the LOI now. You're exclusive with us. And then you're done and you sign it. And then Ted comes along and goes, well, I just did one like you, and it was at 13. You could have gotten up to 13. You just didn't know what the market was like, right? Because there's no MLS listing that shows what all these right. practices sold for, right? Um, and that's the power of doing more of these deals and seeing more of them is that you can, you know where the marketplace is. <clears throat> A lot of advisors that are self-negotiating just don't know where the market is. But everything's negotiable. So- I'm cognizant that in what I'm about to ask you, we're running this podcast at point of time. So this, uh, it may even be dated from when we record until when it goes live as, as markets move as they do. But just as you're seeing all these deals and doing whatever, like a hundred plus negotiations, like, can you help anchor us? Like where, where is the market now? Like what should we be expecting for, valuations and upfront payments versus earnouts and whatever some of the the common levers are like can you help ground yeah, of us course. with numbers no, and no, and or whatever I, it is? I can i can answer it and i'm going to answer this also saying that i'm not a believer as it stands today that interest rates are really a big factor today what would make this market go worse michael is if capital dried up but i believe there's a lot of capital still out there so I don't think it's going to dry up tomorrow. If capital dried up and interest rates were higher, it would be harder. So here's the 10,000 foot view for people. Anybody who's a pure RIA, you're the most valuable. If you're 
a fee-based advisor and you still do some annuity tickets and other brokerage type business, if it gets to be more than 20% of your book, you're a lot harder to sell and a lot less valuable, okay? And if you're like a main commission annuity person, really none of these companies hardly will touch you. There's very few. So why is RIA the most valuable, or at least as compared to fee-based advisors or brokerage firms who might be doing substantively the same fees on substantively the same revenue? Super easy to transfer. Super easy to transfer. It's either negative consent or positive consent in most cases, right? And you know better than anybody, the number of custodians that are out there are smaller and smaller, right? Not that many of them. A lot of these firms really believe that Wall Street believes that the pure fee-based revenue will continue to be the most valuable form of revenue for a long time. And they want to buy that. And so like if you have all your money at, well, I guess Schwab TD together now, Fidelity, and it's super easy and you have your own ADV, they love that business. They love that business. And so, and so, it's, so it's not even just being like under the corporate RAA of my broker dealer in a hybrid environment. You're talking about folks that own their own yeah. outside RAA. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you're a hundred percent fee based under a corporate RIA, it's not terrible, although um, it's a little bit more challenging than somebody that owns their own RIA at Schwab, as an example. But I would say that I would never sell my business um, for less than four times revenue. And when I look at the marketplace today, and if you're bigger, it could be six to seven times revenue. It's that big. If you want to use it, a cash and this is, I was saying, like, is this is driving off revenue, or this is because of the multiple? I'm trying to keep it. I'm trying to keep it. Businesses. No, no, I'm trying to keep it simple for people. Okay. If we went down to EBITDA, you know, uh, I'm usually no less than eight times on EBITDA, but I had one last week that was at fourteen times EBITDA. Okay, and what drives the EBITDA multiple? Size, and is that like the only thing? Just like my. <laughs> For forget no, all the other like no. I'm making my technology more efficient no. and all that like just no, size nobody is cares. my driver. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. Like, like, hard here, re- no. really. Like Listen, all si- the, si- here's what matters. All the si- stuff we do of yeah. like I'm doing all this stuff to systematize my firm and I put a new CRM in place and that's that's not actually driving outcomes. It's cliche, right? But size matters. Okay. Your new marketing engine matters because there's value in you being able to have a provable, scalable model that you can bring in new money on a regular basis. That's valuable to firms. Having a G2 is valuable to firms. Um, Definitely being system- Even if they're not buying from you, the fact that they're there and continue after That's right. Yeah, that's correct. Um, It gives them safety and security for the asset that they're buying. Right. you know, the fact that you have systematized processes and systems is important. It's not going to really add another turn to your multiple. Um, let me let me not break everybody's heart on here, Michael, but the way that you manage money does not matter. It will not increase your multiple. It will not make a difference at all when you sell your business. Okay. So if you think you're really good at it, great. If you think it's going to like make you worth a lot more when you're like, I'm really good and I outperform the market, nobody nobody cares in that world. They don't. So size, size just raw size, uh, your marketing engine, so how the firm brings in money, I guess particularly if you're not still there, and the advisors behind you that can retain the clients after you're gone. Yeah. Like yeah, yeah, I don't want to break everybody's heart, but listen, Michael, I thought I, I built a great brand with oxygen. I really do. I think it was, I thought I had a really great idea back in 2007 and, and, and when I started it in 08 and, you know, X, Y, and nobody was doing it. And I had oxygen machines and I, I had all this cool stuff. And when I, even when I did mine, I'm like, well, what's the value of the goodwill of my brand? And in the end, it was really the engine that that brought in all the assets that was valuable, right? Not the brand itself. And in the context of things like size and marketing, are there thresholds of like, are there size thresholds that matter? Are there certain growth rates you have to be, like organic growth rates you have to hit and sustain for that to be like 
interesting, you know, premium growth versus normal growth or like yeah, premium uh, size versus normal size. Yeah, in general, anything that's at a 10% CAGR on top line revenue is important. You know, if you can grow at 20, it's more sexy, obviously, than it is at 10. Um, yeah. That matters. Uh, and that's, that, that's top line revenue of everything that could be including market. Yeah. Yeah, that can be included in the market, you know, but yeah. that that's really important to these firms. What's kind of funny in this process, and I had it anticipated, let me tell you the death bomb here, okay? Here's the death bomb. Your employees, the people that work for you are 1099, right? Okay. So I ask an advisor, how much revenue do you do? I do 2 million. Okay, well, break it down for me in the practice. Well, Tom manages 100 million, Bill manages okay. 100 million. Are they W-2 or 1099? Well, they're 1099. Who owns the clients? I do. Where does it say that? Where does it say you own the clients? When Tom leaves the firm tomorrow and all those clients go with him, how will you hold them accountable? Be because just in practice, if they're W-2, like you can have an employment agreement, you can right. have non-solicits, you have like IP work product provisions that totally. protect the business. When they're a 1099, if they just leave set up shop across the street and start calling the clients, like you probably don't have any yeah. way to stop them. E even worse, Michael, let me add one layer to this. You get an OSJ, you know, it's Cornerstone Wealth Management. They got 18 people in the firm and they look great on the website, but, you know, eight of the advisors in the firm are all their own 1099s. The OSJ takes a small haircut of, let's say, 10%. That business isn't valuable at all. How are you going to sell that? They're like, well, we're a cornerstone wealth management. We're all going to sell. No, you're not. I've been through this so many times already. You're not going to get everybody to get up on a pedestal and go sell at the same time. You're just not. So unless you build a really solid legal structure, your override is kind of not valuable at all. You know, it just isn't. And size thresholds, like are the thresholds or the break points where you know, the multiple start moving? Yes. Uh, if you are truly at a million of cash flow, it will it will move. Meaning right? revenue or meaning profit? No, no, no. I mean I mean cash flow like EBITDA. Okay. Um, million of revenue helps, but you know honestly, I mean a lot of these firms don't want to buy like four hundred thousand of cash flow. They really don't okay. because um, they have so much stinking money to deploy. They want to buy bigger deals at a time. Yeah, and it's you know it takes as much work as it does to do a four hundred thousand dollar deal, and then it does you know to do a million dollar deal. But a million and then five million, I would say, are like those real thresholds, right? Okay, <clears throat> you, five million you, of earnings. Yeah, okay. yeah, and and so I'm I'm also like I'm coming back to what you said earlier around multiples. I mean, I guess the aside from like size overall and your growth engine and having the advisors for continuity behind you. It sounds like she sheer margins are a huge driver because at the end, right? Like I could generate a million dollars of cash flow on two million of revenue or four million of revenue. Right. I, I may get the same multiple on the cash flow, but if it took me half the revenue to get there, my my earnings multiple is has effectively doubled. Right. Like I I can get four times revenue because I'm getting uh 10x on a 40% margin. Or 10x on a 20% margin that's twice the business yep. size. To so. Totally. And this is what separates the financial advisor from the business owner, right? Somebody who really runs the business like a business and somebody who's there like, hey, man, I made 600 grand this year. It's what, what I had a great year. And it's like, well, what were your margins? I don't know. I made 600 grand. It's like, you know, that yeah. person is probably a good advisor and they're making a great living, but they're not considering the moves to make in the business to eventually sell it for the most value. So as you look back on, I guess, all of this journey, well, so I guess at first, what surprised you the most as you look back on the journey of building your own firm? You were about 15 years in to get to two plus billion by the time the, the sale happened and you were done. So what surprised you the most about the path of growing that business? Well, I wish that I had been smarter to hire like a COO, you know, quicker or something like that, you know, getting somebody in there who could really run operations because I wasn't good at running operations, right? You know, it just wasn't, it wasn't my strength and I should have outsourced that quicker. And a lot of times we don't want to do that because we think we're going to give up control, but giving up control is what's necessary in order to be able to 
to run the business. And I wish I had done that quicker. So you did ultimately hire a COO. It just came later in retrospect than, than you wish. Where, when did you hire them? I think at the point when we had probably, oh, it might've been six advisors or seven advisors. That's really when I should have done it. You know, when I was just starting to scale up, like needing more systems process, I was trying to do all that. I should have done it then. So what was the low point on this journey? Probably the weeks that I would go home and I had 20, 25 appointments. I had dinners at night because I was still doing my marketing and stuff like that. And just the dread of coming into the office every day, thinking that I was going to have to see, you know, five meetings with people. E even though you're like, and you're also doing like 10 media appearances a week, but that was totally fine. Yeah, I love that stuff, dude. But I basically, um, I mean, just think about people that you care about their lives. You do care about their families, but you're coming into those meetings. And I can see why doctors sometimes like don't even want to talk to you, <laughs> yeah. you know, because I was just like, I just don't want to be here. That was a low, hollow feeling when you're making, you know, a seven figure income. So as the deal queued up and the transaction got done, like what, what do you now you, what do you know now you wish you'd known so it would be four, four years ago as you were negotiating this deal for the firm. Well, I wish I knew where the multiples were in the marketplace. <clears throat> I think I could have negotiated my better, a better deal. Um, the biggest thing I have to tell you, which is may sound weird or not, is that I took <clears throat> about 20% of my deal in stock. And in retrospect, I wish I took more. I wish I took more, Michael, because their stock has done phenomenally well. And I never really thought about the term uh, velocity of cash. And I'll explain to you what I mean. Number one, if you make a million dollars a year, just use simple advisor math, over the next 10 years, you're going to make $10 million, right? Yep. But you're going to pay ordinary taxes on that. And if you got $10 million in your pocket today and you paid capital gains tax, who would have more money? after 10 years, right? And then two, the private equity stock will always go faster and harder than the stock of your company because they traded a higher multiple. Like you can't move your engine as fast as they can move their engine. And it, it never really dawned on me, Michael, to think about that, but that's why some people may want to do a minority deal because like even if you swap stock, your stock can't grow as fast as a company that's bigger than yours. It won't. You know, listen, Warburg Pincus is one of the biggest private equity firms in the United States. These guys are unbelievable what they do. For all the grief that some people give PE firms and the way they just try to make money on money, you feel different about that if you own some of their stock <laughs> yourself. I, 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 I feel very different about it today. <laughs> I, I watch, watch how good they are at making money on money. So what advice would you give advisors that are I don't know, th three to five years out from selling and are thinking about like, what does it take to put my firm in a good position for sale? As you've sort of noted, like it may not necessarily yeah. be upgrading your tech and adjusting a bunch of your systems. So what- build, yeah, build a marketing engine, make sure you have a consistent way to bring in new clients and don't say, oh, get referrals. Like that, that is not a marketing engine. Two, I would get your books super clean and be able to explain them like a real business owner. Three, I would make sure at least you have some succession plan in place, some G2 who could take over the book. I really would advise, Michael, over time for people to think about getting out of the business of asset management and focusing on giving financial advice and the client service and being an asset gatherer, right? I think that's a far better model if your idea is to scale to sell. Interesting. So giving financial advice while while gathering assets as opposed to literally like my value proposition is hands on managing investment trading the yeah. assets. Yep. It's like still yeah. so in that frame, like it's it's still running an assets under management model. Just your value is not portfolio management. Your value is the financial advice attached to people whose portfolios Correct. you're tending. Correct. So as we wrap up, this is a, a podcast around success and just one of the themes that comes up is the 
the word success mean, means very different things to different people. And so you certainly traveled the traditional path of business success, right? Literally like built, built an enterprise uh, that sold for tens of millions of dollars. So you've lived the, the business success path. How do you define success for yourself at this point? For me today, Michael, my view has changed in a lot of this stuff. I, I plan to live in Atlanta and be in Atlanta. So I, I think about creating a legacy for my children and a legacy for my community. So I'm, I'm deeply involved in, in uh, things in the city of Atlanta. Uh, some of them are business related, uh, even financially related to try to make, you know, my city the best city to, to live in. So I'm very focused on the city of Atlanta and and my family. I wasn't around them all the time as I was building the business. It was tough. So the kids love me sometimes for it and they hate me sometimes for it, but I, I'm doing everything I can to spend as much time with them as possible now. Very cool. I love it. I love it. Well, thank you so much, Ted, for joining us on the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. Thank you. Want even more ideas, tools, and resources on how to break through to the next level of success as a financial advisor? Check out the leading financial planning industry blog, Nerd's Eye View, at www.kitsis.com, where Michael covers the latest practice management trends and financial planning strategies. And by joining the members section, you can earn IMCA and CFP continuing education credits, along with exclusive member content. Get it all now at www.kitsis.com.